Thank you, Ria. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's um, More Than Words, an overview of our new Pearson at Excel GCC MFL 2024 qualifications. And um, welcome to the hundreds of teachers who have tuned in this afternoon. We have been absolutely inundated with interest for today's event, and we have so much to talk about in this overview. And it is, as I said, we have to stop at five o'clock just before, so I'm going to have to be very, very pacey in what I talk about. Um, my name is Eva McManaman. I'm the Senior Qualification Manager for MFL. I'm going to be delivering this presentation, but in the background, we have a host of uh, many of my colleagues um, who have all been involved in the development of this qualification who are ready to answer your questions or will be following the chats. I won't be able to follow the chat myself because if I start trying to read what you, the comments you make, I won't be able to deliver all the content um, that I, I want to share with you today. Um, with so many teachers logged in, um, please do kind of be aware that we might not be able to get through all your questions straight away, um, but we're going to be trying our hardest in the background. And there'll be moments where I'll be able to kind of ask my colleagues if there's anything particular that's coming through that needs to be answered. So just to get on quickly, we've got a few polls because we do like to find out who's in the room with us. So I'll move on to the first poll. Firstly, how much teaching experience do you have? Are you an early career teacher, an established teacher, a head of department or faculty, a trust MFL lead or any other? And you can, of course, put your answers in the group chat. Um, and I'll just give you a moment to give a response because we do like to know who's in the room, who's trying to find out more about the qualification and what we have on offer. Okay. I'm going to give it a little bit longer just to ensure that everyone who's here as I know some people might just be joining, have a chance, and I'm going to move on. Okay, right, wonderful. So we have a, a very good show of heads of departments in the room, um, but also some of our youngest teachers, not necessarily youngest, newest teachers, um, and established teachers. So welcome, all of you. My next question is, which exam board are you currently using for French, just to be specific about it? Is it AQA, EDUCAS? ourselves, Pearson at Excel, or any others. And again, please put your answers in the group chat if it's one of the others. Okay. I know it doesn't take long for you to press a button, but it takes a while for the answers to filter through. So I'm trying to hold back and move in too quickly. Right, let's see. Okay, so we have a very good representation of our Pearson colleagues in the room, but we also have almost a fifth of you are from AQA or with EDUCAS currently. So welcome. You might not be familiar with my face if you haven't attended one of our um, networks in the past, um, but you're very welcome and um, I hope you like what you're about to hear. And finally, how familiar are you with our GCC 2024 offer? Are you extremely familiar? You've read the whole specification cover to cover and you've had a good delve into the SAMs. Are you quite familiar? You've kind of scanned the spec and you've kind of dipped in just to have a little look at things or have you basically not looked at all at the moment? You haven't had time, unsurprisingly, given the time of year. Um, and you're looking to me today to give you all the information. Okay. Right. Oh, okay. So a small handful of you would say that you're extremely familiar, but most of you are just quiet. You've given it a scan and you obviously are here to find out more information, but uh, more than half of you haven't had time to look at all yet. Okay. So what I want to say to you, um, that 53% there, is that in the downloads that come with this um, event, you should find a document which is labelled 00, zero um, and that's our qualification at a glance. So for anyone has, who hasn't looked at all yet, that might be your starting point just to get a good overview of our content for each paper. I haven't got time in this session today, because it's only an hour, to go into all that detail and walk you through each paper. We'll be doing that when we have our um, launch events in um, next term. So. Um, do make sure you have a look about. We've also got mapping documents, which I think may have just been uploaded today to give you a sense of how the current qualification maps onto this new qualification. So there's lots of ways that you can find out more information and hopefully today will give you a, a nice taste of things. 
So what are we going to cover today? I'll give you a brief overview of the four papers and the key changes from the current qualification. Oh, we're going to have a focus on how our thematic contexts bring language learning to life for your students. We really wanted to give you a background on how we've created compassionate and inclusive assessments that allow all our students to showcase their language skills. And we wanted to give you some information on how we will support you to prepare and deliver the new qualification. Please do kind of stay in the chat if there's anything else that you wanted to learn today over the next hour and we will try to get um, through those if we can or we'll make sure that that's something we cover in our larger launch events kind of post Christmas. Okay, so here we go. This is our, our statement of, of, of being for our development, our vision, that we believe that language is more than words. That's not just a tagline. It's the fact that so much of this qualification has focused on um, a list of words, a vocabulary, um, but it's not just about that. And it's not just about sitting in a group of stressful exams. We know that as language teachers, for you, teaching about your languages, whether it's French, German or Spanish in the room, is about communication and it's about culture. It's about broadening the horizons of your students and making these things available to all your students. Okay, so we have this vision that we've we brought together very early on in our development period and then we have gone back to it again and again to ensure that we are keeping to it and I will read it aloud and if there's any kind of words in there which really uh, speak to you please kind of just chuck that one word into the chat so we know which ones are really important to you as a teacher so built on a foundation of inclusivity accessibility and transparency the Pearson Edexcel qualification takes a compassionate student-centered approach and caters to the needs of all learners regardless of their background ability or reason for studying a language. Combining clear, concise, and straightforward assessments with engaging, meaningful, and relatable content, our new Pearson Edexcel GCSE 9 to 1 Modern Languages qualification is fit for the future, equipping students for life and careers in a global setting. Okay, so I'm not going to look at the chat now. I'm hoping my colleagues have got an eye on that. Um, but this is really based on our research and this vision is something that we want you to hold us to um, during the, the, the rest of the time that this GCSC exists. Well, we want you to let us know if you think that we're never meeting this vision because this has been a touchstone for our development. And what I hope to do in this session is walk you through how we've made this come to life in the qualification. So just to remind you of anyone who was not sure the key features of this qualification and this, these features here apply to all awarding organisations. This is from the DfE and Ofqual. So the basic information is that your year eight so that you're currently teaching will be the first cohort to do this GCSE. That tiering will continue. There's going to be no mixed tiering allowed. And that speaking will continue to be 25% non-examined assessment as it is currently. So that's the basic information. The new elements are this new focus on sound symbol correspondences, um, also called SSCs or phonics. Um, and also there's a different approach in assessment objectives, which I'll talk about in more detail in a moment. There is a very big difference in the vocabulary and that it's a much smaller vocabulary list and obviously and all the words are required. So 1,200 words for foundation tier, and on top of those words, another 500 for higher tier to make up 1,700 words. So that's a huge difference. There's a lot less inference in this new qualification, and it will only appear in reading exams. And we have been allowed to put our rubrics in English for this qualification. So those are some really key differences that I wanted to make sure that you're aware of, which is the same for all awarding organisations. So just to pick up on that issue of assessment objectives, we know that one of the biggest changes has been the assessment objectives, and that's something that's caused a bit of consternation when teachers first see these new assessment objectives, because, you know, as we currently, we have four assessment objectives, one per skill, one per paper. It's very simple to understand and to work out how his assessment objectives are being assessed. Now, 
what we need to kind of realise is that because of the new elements of dictation and read aloud, those wouldn't have sat, sat well in that, that old style where all the elements were separated. Because, of course, if you're doing a dictation, you have to listen and write. And so it's a combination of the skills. <clears throat> So because of that, Ofqua had to create a different style of assessment objectives. And if, you've, if you are familiar with A-level, this won't be such a shock because these are quite similar to A-level assessment objectives. So just to kind of break them down, that first one, A01, understand and respond to spoken language in speaking and in writing. That would be assessed in the listening and the speaking papers. So when you're listening to the spoken language and when you respond in writing, whether you're ticking multiple choice boxes or writing an answer in English, that is A01. When you're listening to your teacher examiner during a speaking exam, and when you speak back, that's A01. You're understanding and responding to spoken language. For A02, understand and respond to written language. So that's what you're reading. Um, and then you respond in what you write down. And then you respond in writing by, um, I mean, the tasks are in English, so you're responding to a task and then you're creation, creating a piece of writing. And this is where we've had our read aloud conversation sit because here you've got a piece of writing that your student will have to read aloud and then there'll be a conversation. So you're responding to the thing that was written down. So that's where we've placed the read aloud conversation. And then finally, there's this 20% for AO3, which is grammar. Demonstrate knowledge and accurate application of the grammar and vocabulary prescribed in the specification. Now, this is quite new in the sense that it is spelt out and given a, 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 a distinct percentage. Grammar was always assessed or currently is assessed in our, our current qualification, and it has to be at 10% in the background. Um, so that, that is there in the assessment objectives. Um, here it's been pulled out and as you can see it's now 20%. So that would be the read aloud and dictation, so a sound symbol correspondence elements and then assessing speaking and writing. Obviously in terms of your reading and listening exams, you're responding and understanding and of course you have to understand grammar, but that comes under those AO1 and AO2. So Read aloud dictation, just to kind of put it in perspective, for us, we've put of about 20%, at 20%, around nine percentage points there are for read aloud and dictation. So when you think about that, the elements which are familiar to you, the speaking and writing, is at about the same level of 10% as it's in the current qualification. So it's just that element of the new SSCs that you need to be aware of for that AO3. Okay. So actually, I just want to go back because I want to kind of say something more about these assessment objectives. Um, we know that this was an area of consternation because you wondered how would these become a qualification? What would happen? Would this mean that there needs to be free papers or that there needs to be mixed skills in papers? And of course, that was part of our um, trialling and our research. And we very quickly wanted to find out what teachers thought about the idea of free papers or mixed skills. And it came out quite clearly that they that would be extremely unpopular, that they were very concerned about the length of exams if you went down to free papers and also that mixing of skills. And therefore, it, kind of, you can be rest assured and you'll see it in a moment that we have broken down um, the qualification in a way that you've told us would be best for you and your students. We've also got a, if you, if you love your numbers and you want to know exactly how the, map, the marks map across, we've created a mapping document, which is in your downloads. Um, and that will tell you exactly how the assessment objectives map across our papers and how the papers map across the assessment objectives. So it does it both ways round. So hopefully you'll find that really helpful if you haven't already um, discovered it. So we've done all the maths for you. So you can just focus on the delivery of some familiar paper structures, which I'm about to show you. I have to click through these again now. Okay. So our aim when creating the qualification was to be as clear and familiar and straightforward as possible. We knew that there was a lot of concern about which new qualification and teachers really had, especially after the, the last couple of years, a lot of change fatigue, um, a lot of concerns about just trying to bed things down and they don't want too much change. 
So hopefully you'll like what you're about to see. We have got paper one. Um, and we've made speaking paper one because speaking comes first. So we've finally made it the obvious choice of being the paper one. Um, and in that speaking, there is a 15 minutes preparation time, which is a slight increase on what your company would be doing. But that's because the number of tasks that need to be prepared has increased because of the read aloud element. So it seemed right to take the opportunity to use a full preparation time that Ofqual was allowing us to have. We've got paper two. The listening and this one obviously has the listening and dictation and I'll talk a moment about that um, the amount of time that we're giving to listening we were very fortunate in that Ofqual released what used to be a maximum amount of time that they would allow for listening and they took that off they no longer had a maximum and we thought right so we want to take make the most of this opportunity because trying to squeeze everything into that very constrained time limit had caused us issues and caused your students issues in the past. And we wanted to make sure that the students were going to get the best exam experience that would fully assess what they were capable of, not what they were able to rush through um, or rely on a kind of memory to get them through. So that's uh, something that I will talk about and pick up later, but thank you Ofqual for lifting that maximum time limit. We've got paper three, reading, and and this one this is very very familiar and very similar. Whereas listening obviously has a new dictation element, the reading really is more of the same, and and hopefully you know, you'll feel very comfortable with that one, especially if you're currently with kind of Pearson. But I think it'd be a, a, a very easy step across if you come from another exam board. Also, the other thing with reading is that the questions. Um, in for inference are very clearly indicated and there's a lot fewer and finally writing um, you'll see that the timings are exactly as we have them now um, the structure is very similar or exactly as we have it now we have kept it things as similar as possible um, we've kept what has been good we've tweaked what we felt needs tweaking and I'll, we'll talk about where those aspects have been in the moment so the other thing you'll notice is that now I've gone through each of the papers just very quickly walking them through, that they each have 50 marks, they each have 25%. A clear and straightforward structure, whether you're foundation tier or higher tier, when it comes to you working out your um, reporting back to senior management in the autumn following exams, you're going to have a very easy job of working out what's happened with the grades and um, where, which, where students would need to get more marks. It's a very clear and simple structure for you. So we've been thinking about you teachers as well as the um, students when we've been focusing on this. We'd kind of love to know how you feel about this proposed structure. Um, so if you do have any questions or if you've got anything to say in the chat, please let us know. We hope that this is um, comforting for those of you who weren't sure what was going to happen um, and you like what you see here. Now I'm just going to see if anyone, or any of my colleagues have anything to um, raise from the chat or I will move on. Okay, I'm not seeing any questions, so I'm going to move on because I'm aware of the time. Right. So the next element we I really wanted to dwell on was the thematic context and how we've brought our language learning to life. Now, I will repeat, we know that language qualification, qualifications are about more than words. The DfE subject content requirements are very heavy on talking about the words and that is something that we have had to be very conscious of and I've got one particular colleague in the background who's been our core person conscious of this vocabulary um, requirements and he knows who he is um, but 1,200 words for foundation tier, 1,700 for high tier, I've already stated that. The extra details was this element that 85% of the vocabulary that we selected has to be from the top 2,000 most frequent words for the language. And that's based on a published corpus. It's a very, very large tome of a, of a piece of publication. And, um, and that has got a lot of information in it about these words that we must use. 
There are also words that were required by the um, DfE. We have done the work of making sure that it's all included correctly in our vocabulary list. And then we had free choice on which of those 2,000 we would use to make up the words that we need for our foundation tier or higher tier, and which are the extra ones from outside the top 2,000 most precious words that we also wanted to include, and which makes the detail and our language learning come to life and, and makes our thematic context meaningful. So we wanted to talk to our teachers and students um, to find out what they needed from us and what their preferences were for, for thematic context. And we have um, done a lot of research with, where we found out that for you, it's really important that um, themes were apparent because language isn't taught in a void. You need to have the thematic context as a hook for your learning. Your students need it too. You told us that the thematic context helped you structure your teaching and support your pupils' learning to give them focus for the assessments. And also, your students want to talk about the things that they enjoy and, and that are important to them. So they told us that things like equality and environmental issues were important to them. So that's kind of the reason why we've cre created the themes that we've created. So for our vocabulary list, we had to combine what we could take from the corpus and where we had options and what we would do with those options um, when we wanted to create our thematic context. And hopefully we've kind of married the two together to produce something which you really like the look of. I'm going to skip over that one because I just want to move on because I can see the time. So you've got all the vocabulary, all those many, many 1,200 or 1,700 words, and then these are for our thematic context. My personal world, lifestyle and well-being my neighborhood, media and technology, studying and my future, travel and tourism. Okay, now we do hope that these all look doable for you as teachers. These all seem familiar and nothing too scary here. But, you know, we have to be aware that with the thematic context or with the vocabulary, let's say, there's not gonna be as many words per theme as in the current qualification. Um, where you have reams of words related to um, travel and tourism in the current qualification, it's going to be less. But what there is going to be are words that can be used across all of the, of the thematic context. So I'm just going to give you one example of um, virus. Um, and that I noticed we had it as something that could be in what lifestyle and wellbeing, because obviously it's about health and people have viruses. But then it was also media and technology, because obviously we you talk about the issue of viruses on computers. But then it could also be about travel and tourism and you having to be careful about what to do if you get a virus when you're abroad and you need to go to the doctor. And so if you see what I mean, Red, that the word, one word can appear everywhere. Um, and therefore, when you're teaching, you're going to have brilliant opportunities to recycle the vocabulary through each of these thematic contexts. I also wanted to pick out the fact that we've used the word my, okay, um, partly because it was very clear um, when we were doing the research that a student's favourite topic, uh, or a teenager's favourite topic, is themselves, and they like to talk about the my and what's going on with them. And, and why not? They should want to talk about their life. They are important. They are, should be valued. And we want them to see that they are valued in our assessments and they can talk about the things that are important to them. The my also is important because every student has a different my. Their personal worlds, their neighbourhoods, their futures are not all the same. So, so they need to understand that they have one future or personal world or something that is important to them but other people and that's what they will read and listen to in our assessments might have different personal worlds different types of neighborhood and different expectations of their futures and we want it to be clear that they can access a wide range of culture and their eyes will be open to difference in the world through these thematic contexts we hope that these kind of thematic contexts provide reassurance and the confidence and cohesion that you need. And we also hope that you see how we have given you the freedom as teachers to choose where you want to bring in the cultural content. There's no set space for culture. Culture is everywhere, it's throughout language. Um, so we hope that that's something that you will kind of value in our design. 
just to kind of delve in slightly more, I've obviously I mentioned about them being familiar. These hopefully are topics which you will have covered in Key Stage 3 or in the legacy GCSEs. We have been inclusive. Different types of families are represented. LGBTQ plus um, issues and identities are represented. Religion, we've got the word religion. There's no way we could have done justice to all the religions, all the nationalities that there are in our English British schools at the moment. Um, therefore, rather than select and include some and exclude others, we have allowed that you know, your students will come with their own worlds, their own um, things which are important to them, and they will learn that extra vocabulary that they need to kind of to express themselves in productive texts uh, when they want to talk about themselves, but everyone equally will have to learn that extra vocabulary. Um, we're not going to privilege some people over others and choose some religions over others. And I hope you can understand why we've taken, taken that approach. We're future focused. Well, we've talked about we have to talk about future opportunities, whichever those opportunities might be. If you want to do apprenticeships and you're not doing A levels, that's fine. If you think you're going to go travelling, great. But some people might never go travelling. Okay, so different worlds, different contexts. We've focused on students' interests. They told us they want to be able to talk about social media and gaming, the things which are important to them. So we've got the vocabulary for them to do that. And they told us about their concerns, as I mentioned, about inequality and environment. And that's not talking about environment as a, a whole big topic that you're going to spend half a term on. We're not talking about the advantages and disadvantages of nuclear energy in France. That's not what we mean. We mean about the environment and what they do in their, in their local world, in their personal world, to help or to think about the future and the environmental issues. OK, so this is kind of keep it personal. We're not keeping it at the broad level. Some students might want to kind of engage with those discussions, um, but that's not what we're intending in terms of our, our content. So just to kind of pull them out a little bit, and I hope this is helpful for you. So those are our six thematic contexts. And within those thematic contexts, there might be, this might be one way that you organise vocabulary content. You might want to think about family, friends, relationships and equality as part of my personal world and physical and mental well-being, food and drink, sports as part of lifestyle and well-being. But as you go down the list, you will see that something like food and drink, well, yes, it can be lifestyle and well-being. It might be something very important to their personal world or it might be something that you touch upon in travel and tourism. Um, so this is kind of emphasizing that point that the vocabulary will get recycled. This is one way of organizing vocabulary content, one way of kind of grouping subjects underneath thematic context, but it's not the only way that you will go about teaching it. Um, and the most important thing to realize is that kind of we have constructed our assessments in a way which uses these thematic contexts to bring them together. You can organize your teaching in this way, but you've also have the freedom to organize your teaching in whichever way you see fits and that covers the, the, the subject content that is set out in the specification. Okay, I'm going to pause again um, and just see if there's any questions that are coming through, anything that I need to answer. I hope that has been a helpful and clear outline of the thematic context for you. And as I said, there's a lot of content to get through. So I've um, wanted to make sure You've had time to digest it. Okay, I'm not seeing anything come through from my colleagues, so I'm going to move on. And because I really want to talk to you about the way we've done a huge amount of research and really wanted to make sure that our assessments are compassionate and inclusive. So early in our research, um, teachers were talking to us about the current qualification. And these are some of the things that they said, and I'm going to read each of them out. And I wonder whether these um, chime with you and, and if there's anything else that you would add in, in the comments. So the first one, despite the topic of holidays being so popular, sometimes the students have very little to say, especially if they haven't been on holiday, let alone abroad. Buying tickets, describing hotels, is completely made up for them. It's very artificial. By the way, I've just seen the comment, you will be getting these slides after this event 
and the recording of the event. So don't worry if you're not getting all the notes down or you're not catching everything. Okay, the second one, why the world? You can't do it justice with the vocabulary. I'm having to teach a geography and the science before I can even explain the vocabulary. This doesn't make it accessible and inclusive. And finally, I agree with the pain points. We definitely struggle. We're in Norfolk and have students who barely leave their village, never mind going abroad. Some of the topics don't link to their future either and how they might use language. We have students who don't have that cultural capital, which is useful when learning a language. And these are just some of the examples of things that we were hearing again and again. Obviously, you, you will all have very different cohorts. Um, some some students, you might have very different types of centres, types of students. You might require that all your students teach languages or it might or learn languages, or it might be that they can self-select. We know that your experiences can be very different. But what spoke to us here was that although language study um, is, it needs to give the opportunity to broaden students' cultural awareness and introduce them to new experiences, that is part of what you want to do as a language teacher. But sometimes, presumptions about shared cultural capital can actually prevent students from accessing that content. And so we want to make sure that at the end point, because obviously we're the ones who create the assessments, that at that end point, there's nothing which is preventing students with more or less cultural capital from equally accessing the assessment. And that is something which has been extremely important to us. The fact that there's a specified vocabulary list and that no words outside of vocabulary lists will be assessed apart from the infer task and apart from some in the um, dictation. I think it's dictation, I need to check that. Um, so apart from that, this specified vocabulary list is meant to reduce the impact of a lack of cultural capital. Um, it's meant to mean that those students who maybe our natives have native speaking parents or native speakers themselves, but they can't do better than those students who have just had a vocabulary list. And that is a, a, a great idea and a great sentiment and we applaud the, the aims there. However, that doesn't change the experience that these students bring to the classroom and bring to the assessments. You know, that knowledge that camembert is a cheese and that champagne is a region of France, not just a drink. But even more basically, as these kind of quotes here show, the difference between a student has never seen France, whether by car, train or plane, and the one who kind of has left, you know, been able to say, leave their town or never leave their town. These are the problems that you as students, as teachers have told us about. That's why we've got a whole section in our specification about cultural content and inclusivity. And we know that there are socioeconomic barriers that we need to overcome. We can ensure that we've moved, removed our, those barriers as much as possible. We really want to ensure that there's equal access to assessments. We want to bring the subject back to the personal, back to what students know and what they're familiar with um, and not testing them on elements that they may never experience in their own language, let alone a foreign language. So they will get stretched and introduced to other cultures, but only ever in a way that is supportive. So as we've been, hopefully it's become very clear, we are really focused on a student-centred design. We want things to be accessible, transparent and consistent. We know that students with less cultural capital are at a disadvantage. We know from our research that students feel less stress when they have confidence in what to expect, when they know what's coming. Students want the chance to show us what they know, understand and can do. They feel like sometimes they're being tricked or sometimes they're being prevented from being able to show what they are able to do. They want to be able to communicate in their target language at the end of the course. That's really important. 83% in our survey put that as the most important skill to be able to communicate. And students have loved the recent changes that we made on our current qualification um, and the way that we've removed those barriers to success. So we've listened to all of this in our design and these are some of the things that we've done to try and improve it for students. So first of all, we want them to feel included in the reading and listening assessments. So the experts are set in, in familiar contexts or where it's unfamiliar, will provide a supportive image. So for example, this is a, shows the Paris Plage, the beaches of Paris. Um, a student who hasn't been to Paris might not understand that there is a, a river flume going through the um, Paris. They might not understand what that, this concept of a beach in a city would look like. 
we've got a supportive image and there would also be out text for the partially cited if there is if there are images we want them to feel confident in reading and listening. We have continued the work that we did with our accessibility amends. We are very careful in our construction of text that kind of you would not believe the amount of work and the amount of time that is taken for us to carefully create the extracts for reading and listening and carefully construct those questions to ensure there are no tricks in their design. It shouldn't be that the questions get more difficult. It's not the questions that should be make it being difficult. The questions should be clear. It's a task, the text that should be getting more complex. And we do that with a steady ramping of that difficulty through the paper. So we're talking about the text getting longer, the types of clauses being used becoming more difficult, the way that the vocabulary is put together, the grammar um, becoming more complex. That is how we ensure that students can work their way through the paper and not feel like they're meeting barriers or want to give up because they've hit a really difficult question and we don't realise that maybe the next question is super easy, they just give up. We want to make sure that we take their hand and walk them through the paper. We also want to make sure we have a consistent assessment structure. So the same question types in the same place for the same number of marks every time. So the students have that kind of comfort blanket of knowing what to expect when they walk into that exam, that there's not going to be something new and strange happening. And the questions will be in order of appear answer appearance in text. So what by that I mean, so they have the text that they've been reading. And then the first question relates to something near the top of the text. The next question, the answer will be coming slightly lower down the text. The third question will be towards the bottom of the text. So that as they work through the questions, that is working through the text. We're also providing a list of names. Um, we were told by teachers and students that sometimes all the, because these many random names which appear in the assessments currently are a barrier because each time there's a, there's a new name of thinking, oh, is, is that a person? Is that a place? I mean, I know it's a proper noun, but what, what is this if they're not familiar? So we've actually included a list of the names that we will be using in assessments. It's, it's, a, it's a long enough list, so it's going to be variation, but your students can know from now, from year eight, they can know that these are the, are the people that might appear in their assessments. And these are appropriate for teenagers in France. We've also got a few older people, because obviously some older people do appear in the reading and listening, um, and they're culturally appropriate as well because obviously kind of France is a very diverse country in itself. Okay, so hopefully that is something that you agree will be helpful, that will only include names from defined list. It will allow students to become familiar with the target language names in advance, and it provides culturally relevant content for them. Some of the student comments from the trials were related to um, the cognitive overload that they have experienced in the current qualification. And we wanted to look at what we could do to reduce that. Uh, we were looking at chunking of text, both in reading and in listening. So by that, we mean rather than a really long extract that they have to listen to or read, that there's a bit, they have their questions, and then we read the next bit, and they have the next set of questions. Um, and the students told us it's easy to think about it when it's in short paragraphs. It made the questions less overwhelming. It's broken down, which um, is better if it's broken down because you know which extract corresponds to each question. And they prefer it because it allowed me to fully understand the passage. So you're not testing them on anything different because they're still reading the same words and they still have the same questions. But it's a compassionate thing to break it down and it helps all the students, not just the lower ability, the higher ability as well, who might be kind of rushing through and thinking, oh yes, I've got that right, but it slows them down and makes sure that they are answering the questions that they're meant to and getting their answer from the place that they're meant to. So not only have we looked at chunking, another way that we want our students to feel calmer when we're in the reading and listening exam is, or in the listening exam, is through more time. And as I said, it's Ofqual who have uh, given us this chance to increase the amount of time in listening, which we are very, very grateful for, because it means that we've been able to do something that we've wanted to do previously, which is increase the amount of repeats. So they can listen once, they maybe know the answer straight away, 
they can listen again, they write down their answer, or they have time for those open response questions to come finish their answers, they listen again, and they can listen again to check because what's, there's no chance for them to check that they got it right once they've listened twice. It's the third time that they can do the check-in. There's no matter how much time or long, how long the pause is afterwards, if they can't remember what was just said, they're not going to be able to check their answers. So that's something that we've been really proud to include in our new design. Um, and we hope that you see the benefit of that as well for your students. And we've looked at our pausing because we now have the liberty to make sure that the pausing is appropriate for the question and for the amount of text. So of course, where there's very short questions, very short little bits of text, we're not going to have long pauses, which a student is just twiddling their thumbs in and getting bored and losing concentration. But as the texts get longer, as the question gets a bit more complex for them, and we're having to kind of decipher things a bit further, then we give them a bit more time to do that. So again, we just want them to feel calm. We don't want, we're assessing what they can hear, not how quickly they can respond or how much they can remember. And so we've, we're assessing their skills, their listening and understanding skills. We want them to feel like they can succeed in reading. So for that inference task, which we know currently is, is the area which is quite difficult for students, it is a straightforward and minimal single word inference task. And I hope you can see here how we've got the word which is to be inferred, which is a word which isn't on the vocabulary list. It's italicized and it's in bold. So it's very clear to the student where that word is. And the question is asked them to use the information that's around that word to decide what's the best translation for it. So I hope you can see that that is a very um, straightforward way of approaching inference for your students, something they should all be able to attempt. We also want our students to feel well prepared for the speaking exam. They told us many times that they get very stressed out by the speaking exam um, and very worried about something that's going to come up which they can't talk about. So we would thought that within the team, what can we do to ensure that they feel as well prepared as possible for that speaking? So first of all, our tasks are designed to be within the students' own experiences as much as we can do that. Obviously, some students have quite limited experiences, other students have a wealth of experience that's beyond even our experiences sometimes. Um, but we want to, we, as much as possible, we kept it in what would be expected of a teenager and what they could maybe be involved in. For the read aloud, we did our trialing and when we had our feedback from the teachers, we asked them kind of what they noticed about the students and what was necessary. And they made it very clear to us that the students were reading those texts aloud before they were being tested. That was the way that they needed to prepare. And also they annotated their texts they, they were writing on the card. So we had to think about, that. okay, well, how can we ensure that a student can read aloud when, you know, in the invigilation time, in that invigilation room, which sometimes is shared with lots of students, obviously they can't be reading aloud. Um, that wouldn't be appropriate. And that's why we've put this one minute preparation time for when they've moved into the exam room and they just do have one minute longer to get their tongues around the words so they can feel like they've had a go at preparing it before they actually are being assessed on it. And they can take that annotated stimulus card in with them and we'll, don't worry, we'll give enough copies of those cards so that they can be annotated. Another way we have our students feeling well prepared is with the role play. And the fact that we have provided in advance the possible transactional settings for the role play. Um, we thought very carefully about the role play and, and the fact that over the speaking paper, there needs to be formal and informal settings. And we thought about the role play and how weird it is when students are having to pretend their teacher is their friend and have a, a, a social conversation with them. And we thought actually in this very weird situation of the role play, which I'm sure you all agree is, is, is very strange and not contrived, it's probably best that that is put in that situation where a student might encounter in the future um, in a public setting and that they, you know, it's something they would experience perhaps if they travelled or if someone were to come here and needed help from them, even in, in their future employment and future roles. So this is where um, we have laid out the 10 locations um, that those settings can be in and a finite list of interactions. 
um, which they would be expected to do, such as ask um, for, for ask for directions, um, um, say where they want to sit, etc. Um, the prompts in the order that they will be used and the question to be asked is always in the same position. So the students can know what to expect when they come into the role play and they know kind of what's going to be asked of them um, in the um, task as much as they can know in advance. We also want them to feel control in the speaking, not just prepared. So they, because they told us they were so fearful of not having control. So they have a choice of pictures for the picture task. We provide two and they can choose which one and just to have to describe one. They have to give, um, describe the people, location, activity, and that is a clear and consistent instruction whether foundation or higher, every student has to do that, people, location, activity. They can choose their um, thematic context for their conversation and picture tasks beforehand. And when I mean beforehand, that's you know, as in a couple of weeks, as in currently, where they get to state what they want to talk about, not on the daily exam. Therefore, you as a teacher can also be prepared. Um, because then there's, a, there's plenty to talk about within one thematic context, and there's going to be plenty of questions, and they won't know what pictures will be coming up. But at least they have that confidence that there's an area of the speaking that they can be ready for. Obviously, all your teaching will make them ready for the whole speaking exam, but for the students, at least they can walk in knowing that they, they've got themselves sorted in one element. And we've privileged communication um, in the speaking. And by that, I mean, um, for that conversation element, ele element, we've given more time and more marks for the conversation. Okay. So I hope you agree that that is um, a way that can, we can support students on what can be a very stressful element of the assessment. Okay, I can see the time skipping on, so I need to move on. Um, I'll just quickly talk about writing and the fact that we have a clear scaffolding bullet points. There's either three bullet points for the shorter task or four bullet points for the longer task, whether foundation or higher. Okay, and our use of a color image in the um, foundation question. And it might not be because a student wants to talk about the boys' yellow coats. That's not why a colour image is useful. Colour image is obviously just, uh, it's, it's better, to, it's more engaging, it's clearer to see what's going on in the picture. So we think that's kind of important for the writing exam, that they can actually see what they want to write about. Um, and there's always going to be a choice of writing task, which is obviously something we've brought in for the current qualification and we've made sure is happening from this summer for all our um, writing tasks, foundation and higher. So I hope you agree with me that in our assessments, we have tried to ensure that our students feel seen, they feel heard and they're going to be represented and that we've worked as hard as possible using techniques that which will mean that every student no matter their ability, is able to um, access all the content of the assessment. Okay, the final section. Um, obviously, we've got 10 minutes left. I need to be as quick as possible. So we would like to ensure that we're supporting you to prepare and deliver. Uh, so I have a small child coming in. Um, and she needs to go because this, I'm doing a delivery of an event. Thank you. No, you go now. Thank you. Sorry about that. Okay, so supporting you to prepare and deliver. Right, we have a clear timeline. Um, it's as clear as we can tell you because the main thing for you to note is until we are accredited for French, we're not able to um, deliver, sorry, we're not able to submit German and Spanish. Okay, so the first sight of German and Spanish specs might not be until autumn 23, but what you can be assured of is that they would follow the same structure as we're presenting here for French. Okay, we will be having launch events soon also. Um, we need to help you to get started because you know, you're as important to us as the students. We want to support you with our mapping documents, which actually it says coming soon. I think they might actually be uploaded today. Um, plenty of vocabulary support. We are working currently on mapping against the legacy vocabulary list for AQA Pearson and 
also the NSELP Key Stage 3, because I know for some of you it's very important that you've been following NSELP schemes of work at Key Stage 3 and you want to see how that content is coming through into our, our qualification. We'll be having an editable spreadsheet, but beyond that, we also are working on an interact interactive vocabulary app. So we will have much more functionality than a spreadsheet and will help you with your planning, organising, checking and assessing. So that, that, that is to come and obviously we're working on that um, whilst we're work waiting for accreditation from Ofqual. We're also going to support students with sound files for every word, and that will be coming soon. We've got the sound files. We just need to make them available in a way that is suitable for you all. But I think you you know how the words sound, but I think for your students, it will be really helpful that when they click on a word, they can hear it spoken, especially if they're being assessed on pronunciation now. We've got the assessment objective overview, which is in your packs, and we will be launching our half day launch events um, in the new year. So those be, will be available to book very soon. So and in those ones, you'll get much more detail on the breakdown of each paper and we'll look at the questions. Of course, there'll be course planners and schemes of work and we'll be getting ready to teach training when it comes to that point from next autumn and when you've got a year in advance of the actual sitting and plenty of guidance and walkthrough videos which will be available on demand. Our teaching and learning team who are responsible for your resources, now that they've finally seen the um, first draft, um, they are building their new offers of new resources that meet the vocabulary and the subject content requirements. Okay, so they will be built on carefully planned progression and accessible approach systematically building students' knowledge of phonics, grammar, and vocabulary, providing a comprehensive coverage of all elements of the new specification. Um, it will be powered by Active Hub, which is a, a next generation digital MFL service. So um, adding a bit more um, in terms of digital resources and online learning anywhere, anytime. Um, it will be differentiated for high-end foundation tiers and will be a well for gamified digital vocabulary practice. Okay. And there'll be comprehensive support for assessment coming from the teaching and learning team with plentiful opportunities, perhaps new star assessments. Um, and what we'll be doing from our side of the business, um, we'll be providing exempli exemplification of the mark schemes. And some of that is already available in the sample assessment materials because we wanted you to be clear how we apply the mark criteria. We will give more exemplar responses for writing, speaking and dictation. We're going to have banks of read alouds and dictations for you, an additional specimen paper, and also secure mock paper, because I know for a lot of you, you're very keen that your students don't see, don't have any chance of seeing what possibly they could um, have a mock on and that you prefer it to be secure. We'll obviously have a speaking task, walkthrough, video and scripts, and a sequencing tool which we provided, and of all, always is conducting speaking exam training. Um, which we'll be providing to you. So there's so much to come. Um, every year we have the free support that we always offer of exemplars and commentaries from each exam series, regular online and face-to-face -face teaching network session. I'm saying face-to-face -face because obviously it's been quite a period of going, being online, but it is great that we have finally been going back into centres and I've been loving meeting teachers and talking to you in your in where you work and, and hearing from you exactly what's going on in the day-to-day. You get free access to scripts and we have our if you're familiar with pearson we have exam wizard and results plus exam wizard is a repository of past papers there won't be obviously many past papers for a new qualification but there's always the, the previous ones that you can kind of dive in and make use of for those little end of term tests that you might want to create and results plus is a fantastic tool for analyzing the breakdown of your students performance and we can always walk you through that Okay, so oh, I've finished even quicker than I thought. I must have sped through those last few slides. So we've got a final poll um, because we'd really love to hear from kind of but following what you've heard today, and I hope I haven't spoken too quickly. Um, how likely are you to recommend others to consider the Pearson LXL GCSE offer? Okay, so if you could let me know, it was extremely likely, quite likely, or unlikely. Um, that would be really fantastic and I will click through and then I can see if there's any questions or anyone, any of my colleagues in the background, there's a few minutes, if there's anything they need to raise from the questions or common themes, they can come on. 
Okay, I think I've left enough time for you to answer that one. Fantastic. Oh, that's what we like to see. Oh, brilliant. Well, we're very pleased. Please do recommend to others. Um, as I said, we will be having launch events. And I think Mike is going to put in a link for um, where you could go to um, re request more information. So you can register your interest and then you'll ensure that you're getting all the information. And one of our switch consultants, if should you wish to be switching to this new qualification with us, will be able to walk you through all the details and help you with that process. Okay, right. Do any of my colleagues want to come on and let me know what else there was that was discussed or should do we finish actually three minutes early, which is a record? I'm finally going to open group chat to see. Hello. Hi, Katie. Hi. Uh, um, I think that by the time we got to the end there, there were lots and lots of questions that people had had about resources, which hopefully Eva has now covered. Um, the update from our teaching and learning colleagues is that they don't currently have um, dates that they can share, but they are working very hard and quickly to make those dates available and share them with you. Um, so just a couple of points around that. Because the new GCSE vocabulary content doesn't presume any prior knowledge, you'll notice when you look at it, it literally starts with numbers one to ten days of the week. So you can be really confident that everything that you're currently covering with your year eights who are going into the GCSE for the first time, it's your, I use this phrase, not flippantly, it's your bog standard key stage three vocabulary content coverage. The content, the context, the teaching and learning materials that you've put so much time and effort in, you can carry on using those. Um, and because of the frequency based approach for the vocabulary selection, it's highly likely that the significant majority of vocabulary in your current materials is going to find itself represented on the new GCSE. So you can carry on using what you've got, but they are working um, very hard and very fast on getting those new fully aligned with the new GCSE materials available. It might seem a bit funny that they've only recently got sight of the draft materials, but our publishing colleagues are not allowed to see the draft materials before you do. It's um, a requirement of our regulatory framework. So that's why they haven't been able to um, get on to sooner but they are working super fast and they um, would like us to assure you that they will be ready in more than enough plenty of lead and time for 2024 first teaching and if you're doing a three a three year key stage four or you're concerned about your current key stage three carry on using what you use carry on doing what you do you will be fine and when you see those mapped vocabulary lists which Eva mentioned you won't just have to take my word for it you'll see that actually that content is is very much aligned um, a couple of people have asked if they could have a little bit more um, detail about some of the question papers. What I suggest okay, you do will be uh, ending now oh, because we can't go over have the Have a look at the second yeah. at a glance and come to the launch <laughs> events in the new year in January, February, and we'll go into much more detail or contact the subject advisor.